Hey guys, so despite the hat, I'm actually in Calgary, Canada, and the first thing you notice is, number one, the beautiful architecture. Um, almost all the houses are just fantastically beautiful, well, very well made, and also the trees. You get kind of trees over here that ultimately are different, like fir trees. You don't really get those in California where I'm from, or even in Oklahoma. And what's interesting uh, is, number one, you know, you've got a country a province, I shouldn't say country, at least in Calgary and Alberta, that revolves around the oil and gas sector. And that's the second thing you notice. It's not, it's actually not just oil and gas. It's everyone leaves out the third part, oil, gas, and refining. The refining part is, is with the, you know, actually sometimes even more interesting because you've got two kinds of, at least two kinds of crude oil, which is heavy and light. And uh, I don't want to get into too many details, but you know, you see these trees that you just don't, this is just beautiful, right? And so it dawned on me within a couple of hours actually of coming here, and it is my first time, that Calgary is basically Texas, but with better weather, it's, it's, it's 8 a.m. now, so it just started to rain, uh, but in the summertime, it is unbelievably gorgeous, even much better than California even. And so you've got Calgary, being Texas with better weather and a lot nicer nature. I mean, you've got Banff, uh, B-A-N-F-F -F Park, uh, very close by, about an hour and a half by, by car. And then you've got Louise Lake sort of right around there, um, around that mountainous area. So the problem here is I shouldn't be able to figure out an entire province within two hours of landing. I shouldn't be able to figure that out, but that's what's one of the problems with being so close to America is that for the most part, your Canada's economy is still based on a Texas style oil and gas and refining system. And ultimately, very few countries over the you know, post-World War II, because oil was so essential um, to creating an economy that was mutually beneficial, not only to winning the war, but also the post-war economy, uh, where it's almost everything, whether it's the asphalt, I mean, that's oil. That black stuff you see down there on the ground, that's an oil product. Plastic, that's oil. Um, and so, I mean, look at these houses. I mean, it's it's unbelievably gorgeous here. If you if you want to raise a family, and uh, because its oil prices are still have come down, I think they're still expensive, but um, look at this house. Brand new, you know, great design. And it's not like the cookie cutter houses you see in the in the US, which again are a consequence of, um, of, of, an, of an American plan to house uh, veterans who've come back from the war. And so because of that, we built sort of like something called a Levitt Town, where you have sort of a very similar construction. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why so many cities that had a lot of veterans are based on a cookie cutter map, you know, um, basically a, a, a cube uh, with, you know, and you know, X's and Y's uh, going through it. Um, so, and, and over here you see a lot more diversity in architecture and nature as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm just kind of stunned by all these houses. And, and the reason, reason is because I come from California and, you know, we had a large back in the day after World War II because we were so close to ports, San Diego, LA, um, and San Francisco, that ultimately, you know, we, we really did have a, a lot of influence coming in back then uh, from Washington DC's policies. Um, and it's not until you go to a foreign country that you, even though it's not really a foreign country, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, that you see, that you start to understand history a little bit. The reason that I, I mean, like I said, look at, look at these plants. So, Obviously, the weather can't be that bad if it's even though they do get about five months of winter. Um, but those plants look perfectly alive to me. So let's talk about the economy and, and mutually beneficial economic arrangements. And ultimately, one of the reasons that the economy here goes up and down, which of course impacts its ability to absorb immigrants, um, is ba based on the price of oil. Now, we know in retrospect that the Soviet Union collapsed because it did not diversify its economy. Uh, it was basically based on oil. It didn't need that from anybody else because it had plenty of it on, on its own. So it became an expert in building the infrastructure. Um, that's why you see so much infrastructure even today 
in Soviet bloc countries um, that, that still functions today. This is stuff that was built probably in the 1940s. Uh, whether it's an escalator um, in, of all places, Georgia, modern day Georgia, the country, um, or even the buildings in some places you go, they're still there. They were built for functionality. And it turns out that humanity probably needs a little bit more than functionality. Um, and that was sort of maybe the missing piece in, in the Soviet structure. Um, but part of that, of course, was the idea that they wanted to be a little bit different than what they considered to be the superficiality of the West. And, and I'm still sort of, well, what's actually another thing that I've noticed here is, you know, when I say it's just like Texas, is I've seen within, you know, just within less than 12 hours of being here, uh, probably a church on every other corner. I know I'm in, and I'm in the suburbs, right? That's a little, also a little bit odd. But what I think is really interesting is that you have a lot of different churches here. So you've got, um, I passed by a Mennonite church. There's a Seventh-day Adventist church. So first church, I think, is... So I can't even tell what that is. I mean, I, I, I can usually tell um, because it doesn't seem like it's Christian science. But it's also, it might be part of the congregation that Pat Boone, who was really famous back in the day, back in the 1950s, um, he popularized it, uh, but I can't tell. So that's what's interesting. So you notice if you go to Texas, it's the same thing. And the reason for that is when you don't have a diversified economy, you end up in a position where you create a system where because you don't have enough development coming from your Washington, D.C., uh, in this case, the centers of power in Canada would be Vancouver and Toronto, you end up with other actors, other economic actors, moving in. And in this case, and in, in, in most of the world, that would be the nonprofits. And the nonprofits could be things like the NGOs, some of which are run by George Soros, who's becoming controversial in Eastern Europe. He had to actually move out of his, you know, Hungary um, and into Vienna. He had to move his institute out of there. But what people don't realize is that nonprofits have an, have an economic advantage. And because of that, they're able to come into places that are that are typically um, how do you say this? That are typically not, you know, the other other major actors are, are typically not interested in. And so that's where you get this interesting clash between existing NGOs, existing nonprofits like religious entities, and then the new ones coming coming in, whether they're funded by a liberal billionaire or a liberal conservative. So you're seeing a lot of vested interests popping up and then clashing with each other. Um, something that I think the central government didn't quite expect. You know, there's nothing in a plan that says, in a budget that says, what do we do if we're trying to create a system uh, doing X and a billionaire comes in and creates a nonprofit doing Y? So, and again, look at these colors. I mean, I just want to show you, this is a nice backdrop of the colors. You've got the trees and the colors. So you can see it's, it's unbelievable. It's just beautiful here. So um, let's get back to why I think Canada has a ways to go before they call themselves a sovereign country. So you're not a sovereign country when the president of your next door neighbor calls you up and says, go arrest this executive based on our economic policy, based on our desire not to want to compete uh, fairly with another country that is also a major power. If a country can do that, and you basically say, okay, without any resistance, it doesn't mean necessarily that you've got a seamless legal system. It means ultimately that you've sacrificed your sovereignty to another nation, because we know that if Canada wants to call and say, you know, to, to, to the U.S., go ahead and arrest the president of Mexico, um, that would never happen. Or go ahead and arrest the, you know, the executive of Lala or, you know, Bimbo Foods, uh, or another, any other major company, nobody in the U.S. would do that. But when it, because it would cause an international incident. It would just cause major problems. Um, but so you can see, number one, the power differential. What I'm trying to say is that Canada does not have a choice. Its economy, to the extent that it's run on oil and gas, needs to be shipped. This is, it needs to be shipped someplace else because North America is very isolated. And so because of that, you're dependent on the U.S. Navy for shipping your product to other places like Europe, which needs it. Um, you know, like a lot, almost everyone needs oil because post-World War II, that was what the economy would be based on. So when you talk about development, again, a lot of that is just asphalt. People haven't figured out how to, even in Singapore, which is, you know, really advanced, 
uh, they haven't figured out how to sort of get away from this oil-based system. Although Singapore, of course, hedged its, hedged its bets by having a uh, train system that's extremely efficient called the MRT. But even they, because they're under U.S. influence, ended up having a system where they were using oil products uh, fairly recently in, ter in terms of expansion. So here's another beautiful con construction. You can see how you have a boom bust whenever you have oil running the economy. Beautiful. Brand new, obviously. So whenever oil prices are high, which they were like two years ago, construction goes up. Everything, everything does well if your economy runs on oil. You get a lot more jobs, people want to move in. Um, that's how it works. So when problem is when it doesn't, when oil prices go down, suddenly you've got a problem. So when you have a problem, um, you become hostile to a lot competition, whether it's immigrants or anybody else. People think, well, that doesn't happen here. Well, Trudeau wasn't always president. Uh, the conservatives were in charge for quite some time, you know, several years ago. Uh, and a lot of that is, again, based on the economy and the oil prices. Now, Texas tried to diversify away from oil and, and went into banking. It failed because it started making banks to all the friends of all the oil executives and all the oil managers. So that's where you had the SNL crisis in Texas where all the banks failed, had to be bailed out. And it's a long time, a long time before 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, but you see how history repeats itself uh, quite, quite easily. Um, and the question is, what can Canada do? Because it's, again, if you're not really a sovereign country, because you're dependent on another country to transport your primary export, oil or natural gas, uh, and because you're dependent on that country, when the president, uh, who, whom you allegedly dislike, says, I want you to sign this free trade agreement, even though it's going to disadvantage you, and as part of this free trade agreement, I want you not to talk to my competition over here in China. Can't, can't talk to him, can't trade with him, unless you get my permission. And unless you give me, essentially, a, a first, I wouldn't call it a first right of refusal, but just the first ability to negotiate a better package. Uh, so that I keep my competition away from my neighbor. Um, so you you see that you're having all these issues that, again, revolve around a lack of diversification within the economy. And what I don't get is if you're a progressive and you know that economic downturns historically disadvantage minorities and immigrants, and you believe that immigrants are necessary not only to create economic growth because they buy things and they're adults and they need things when they come in and they can't just get government jobs when they show up. Um, so they have to be somewhat productive immediately. Um, if you believe in that, then why don't you also believe in the diversification of the economy so that you don't, so you lessen these bumps within economic systems. And in doing so, you also lessen the shocks that eventually will hopefully lead to another system, political system, it's all tied together, that will prevent the election of demagogues. And if you don't, you may find yourself one day in Canada's position where they claim to be a sovereign country. And, in, and indeed, they're only a sovereign country because Quebec pushed away the Americans. The Americans were actually gonna advance into Canada. And it was because of the Quebecois that this is still a place called Canada. That's why the Quebec, which I actually don't like that much. Um, and the reason I don't like it is because once you know, they've actually formed an, an identity that is really based on, you know, we, we are independent and they are. Uh, we speak French, not English, and lot, that is actually based on pushing back the Americans uh, and not ending up in some sort of like, you know, homogenous situation where you, you can compare the country to Texas within two hours of showing up. Uh, but of course, in anytime you have an, an identity that is based on opposition to something else, it's not really, it's not, it's not optimal. So one of the things you have moving forward in this post World War II economic system that has to be changed is how do countries come up with an identity that is sustainable? And I hope it involves economic diversification.